So today we are going to be looking at the best telescopes and asking the question what makes the best telescope, what are the best features and what gives the best results. You may well be able to have a go at this already so if you want to have a crack at the following question. What are the advantages of using a reflector mirror rather than a refractor telescope? Answer me. So, what makes the best telescopes? And well, I'm t you know I'm telling you here from this question. Obviously, a reflector mirror makes a better telescope rather than a refractor telescope. So. If you're watching this for the first time, you've never encountered this idea before, I can understand your frustration. We've just spent ages looking at why lenses are used and how lenses are used to make refractor telescopes. But actually, lenses and refractors do not produce the best telescopes of them all. That honor goes to reflectors and reflector mirrors, which make the best telescopes. So these diagrams here show a couple of different setups of how you can use a reflector mirror in place of an objective lens. So here um, on the right hand side here you can imagine us having a distant object that some light is going to come from. So you know this could be a star or a planet do not know what I've drawn there but you can imagine some object with light coming from it this direction. Now if the light comes from it and passes into our telescope and can be reflected by a concave mirror, if we can get a, a concave reflector mirror to produce a focus here in the centre then the eyepiece can still interpret that focus like it used to do in our objective, sorry, in our refractor telescope. So it's pretty much doing the same process, but rather than rather than refracting it to a focus and then putting it through the eyepiece, we reflect it to a focus and then put it through an eyepiece. Now if we're reflecting it, the key difference is obviously it's concave rather than convex and it's reflecting rather than refracting but the same objective can be achieved we still get a mirror focus now this slide that I've shown up on the screen here we've got two sort of different designs here but they're essentially doing the same thing light coming in reflected and these are two different setups one we have the focus before the eyepiece so we focus it and then pass it through an eyepiece and out or we could do it where we are so this one is a slightly less curved design at the bottom. So it's less curved, it's a less powerful mirror. So it's got a longer focal length, but then by reflecting it in this plane mirror, a flat mirror, they reflect it out of here and have the eyepiece on the side. So this could be a practical solution to how to get this image actually outside of the mirror onto the outer edge of your telescope so that you can look in the side and see what's going on. This is a picture here of a concave mirror. Now in this case this point here is our focus and these rays all the way up here could be our light rays. Now all of these all of these arrowheads here are pointing outwards but let's ignore those arrowheads for a minute imagine well, you can forgive me putting these arrowheads in the wrong way imagine our light is all coming in this way from an object on the right traveling towards the left as this light comes in according to the angle at which it strikes this surface the light will be reflected back to a focus so this mirror now becomes the objective. It's not a lens, it's the objective mirror. Here's a focal point. The light travels on through a little bit in all these different directions. Stick it through an eyepiece. 
and then we can observe the image same as we did before but this time we're using a reflecting mirror rather than using a lens well why bother what's the point we we know that we can use reflectors we know that sorry we know we can use refractors we've seen how they work we've seen the geometry of them why would we bother what are the advantages of using this reflector rather than a refractor and the sad truth is that lenses are losers and this sad gentleman here is Mr. Lens. I'm a loser, baby, so why don't you kill me? Mr. Lens will act as a visual aid for you. I want you to remember Mr. Lens when you go into your exam. I'm going to talk you through his downfalls and his negative features. And you're going to remember these when you come to do your exam. And if you remember this image, you'll be able to describe why Mr. Lens is such a loser. I'm a loser, baby. First up, R is for refraction. What makes lenses good and what makes lenses work is the fact that they are able to refract light and focus it. But this is also a negative point. It's simultaneously a good thing and a bad thing. Because when refraction takes place, it affects different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum differently. This is why a prism works, because the red light is refracted to a lesser degree than the blue light. And this is what allows us to separate light, and this is good. It's handy for us to use sometimes. But watch what happens here when we've got white light coming into a lens, a convex lens, because the blue light is refracted more than the red light is we end up with focus or foci at different points so our blue focus is at a different position from our red focus so if we're trying to form an image say here well if it is exactly at this point that the image is being projected onto the blue is not in focus and in fact nor is the red so a problem an inherent problem with using a lens is that you're not able to get all of your lights to focus or sorry all of your colors to focus in at one point so to to highlight this let's um let's show this look his our colors are not not focusing at one point our colors are sort of bleeding into each other so look his red bit of his pants are bleeding into the green bit and his green pants are going to his pink leg his ginger beard is going to be all over the shop in a minute nothing wrong with a ginger beard but you don't want it all the way down here and look his blue eyes are leaking into his head. He looks ridiculous. That's why he's a loser. And one of the many reasons he's a loser. Second reason that lenses are losers sagging. Just highlighting an area of saggage. Two big areas of saggage here. Lenses sag. What do I mean by that? Well, let me draw you a quick picture. If you have a big piece of glass, and let's say we're trying to get a lens that's really large, say that this if this lens is any more than one meter across, and we're holding this lens in position for a while, the force of gravity acts upon this lens and glass actually will over time will feel the effects of this glass by by this of this force by the particles of glass starting to change so over some time this will lose some of its shape it will become shallower on the top and fat and saggy in the middle so it loses its natural shape and we've already discussed how important the geometry is so if you lose your shape if you get saggy you lose all right next up smoothness 
check out this loser this is not smooth he does not have Nivea Sun skin he is a unsmooth uncool loser if you cannot ensure that you have a perfectly smooth surface all the way across here then the smallest nicks and blemishes or if there's cracks or bumps or lumps or anything on here it what it's going to do is mean that your light coming through so if you've got light coming through like this then instead of all curving in the same direction you're going to get bumps and lumps in the curvature and that's going to end up with a blurry image so back in Galileo's day back in the 1600s he had to hand polish his lenses and had to make sure that they were as perfectly smooth as you could possibly get them and even now if they try to use this they've got to try and make them perfect but you know we're, we're quite limited as humans and we can't make a perfectly smooth surface because if you zoom in on the microscopic scale you find out that it's not a smooth surface it's cracked and it's ragged and it's jagged and you're a loser the lens is a loser right what else it's fat in the middle check out the fat in the middle I'm going to highlight here the fat region which is the midriff if your lens is fat in the middle then actually all the light that is traveling from your distant star or your planet or whatever it is you're looking at it actually ends up having to travel through I don't know 25 centimeters 40 50 centimeters of glass and if it's doing that even if you're trying to use the clearest best brightest glass that we have it's going to end up absorbing some of the light so if you've got your fat middle bit of the glass here it absorbs some of the light and then that means you can't get as bright images that means you can't actually record as much light as you would have otherwise have got you do not get the bright images because your big fat middle has absorbed it all you loser and finally lenses are good for the visible part of the spectrum only and the way that we're going to remember this he's wearing these rather unattractive visibles that's the brand of trainers that uh, our loser is wearing and everyone knows that visibles are risible google it visibles are risible google it right yeah this is this is the uncoolest brand you could get you loser what you would have rather have had i'm sure was some x-ray trainers or some uv sneakers or perhaps even some microwave um, what's another word for shoes name, name some shoes beginning with M moccasins some micro moccasins oh, I don't need to put in the names of shoes you get my point these, these aren't cool shoes so check out this guy refraction sagging smoothness fat in the middle visible part of the spectrum only he's not got what it takes to form the best image surely not hopefully this is a way to help you to remember some of the disadvantages of using lenses to make your telescope all right so let's use a mirror instead let's use a mirror and then that way we can get a better image that doesn't suffer these negative effects here uh, 
um, I've got shown a such a concave mirror and we've got two different sets of light coming in here look there's there's light coming in the red light coming in from parallel to the principal axis of this mirror we've also got some light coming in green light here now it's not necessarily that it, the light itself is green it's just to show that it's coming in from other directions but look what what this does demonstrate is that light coming in from any direction gets focused to a point so all the red light will get focused to this red focus here and all the green light will get focused to this well let's actually to this brown focus here but the, the green light is all going to be reflected on there due to the geometry of this shape wherever the light's coming from as long as the beams are parallel to one another they'll get focused to the same focus and that is very useful because that means that when you build a telescope you don't even need to turn your telescope round to look exactly at what you're trying to look at this is an example of a telescope a large reflector telescope where they've got a concave mirror built into the ground now this is a three-dimensional mirror but still it you know it looks like this this is like a cross-section of that three-dimensional thing and here up in the middle suspended in the air on this sort of crane system they've got a detector now they can move this around in the air in three dimensions and move it to the focus so this really can view anything sort of up in a large cone shaped region above the mirror so it can actually sort of view anything in this area because if light comes in from here it will get focused up to here and you simply have to move the detector over and place the detector here so that it can record that light but if the light was coming in this direction then it would get reflected up to here in which case you move the reflector over to this side and you record the light here so we've we've got this movable detector that you can yeah basically face a lot of different directions and collect light from all those different sides this is a diagram of a radio telescope and in fact that last picture I showed you was also a radio telescope which is designed to collect EM radiation from the radio part of the EM spectrum and as you can see similar sort of thing we've got this dish it collects the light coming in and can focus it up to a central point in here notice this disk is the same shape as anyone who's got if you've got satellite TV same sort of thing same principle you've got this satellite shape you've got this yeah this collector and it will focus it to a central point so that you can see that radiation you can collect that radiation all right question of the day is bigger better bigger is better question mark well when it comes to telescopes is this true what are the advantages of having a big telescope you want to have a big telescope and generally bigger is better does hold firm for this principle here you want to have the largest aperture possible the big ones are the most effective larger largest aperture possible because it collects the most light and it gives the clearest image now this first point is a no-brainer it's big it lets lots of light in okay this second point we're going to need to hone in on a little bit and see well, why is it that a larger aperture gives a clearer image so we're going to focus in on this one a bit 
and in order to understand this we have to understand another um, oh actually before I set about answering that myself why don't you have a go see if you can answer this question why do bigger telescopes give clearer images what is it about a bigger telescope that means it's going to give a clearer image Stop the tape. all right so I'm going to try and help you answer this question here why do bigger telescopes give clearer images and the answer to this is based upon another physical property of waves diffraction we've already looked at refraction so far and the way that light changes when it moves from one medium to another but diffraction is another effect that can take place and it affects light as light moves you know what I should change that I shouldn't say as light it should be as a wave because it's as a wave passes an object okay so the basic principle here is that if you have light and it's or a wave traveling along and it goes past the edge of an object it spreads out around that object so I'm going to draw a little crude diagram here let's say I've got a a big stick or a big wall and I'm sending some waves along towards this wall as this wave approaches this wall the top half is going to carry on past it but what we should actually find is that this wave spreads out around this part of the wall so on this side while there might be zero signal here because there's no wave actually being sent to it here you get a non-zero signal because the wave has been diffracted around the edge of this object and actually has traveled and spreads out in all directions as it passes this object and this can have quite a significant effect in terms of your telescope okay now this is a still image showing the effect that I was talking about a moment ago we've got our plane waves coming in here and when they hit this edge they spread out but here now what I've, what I've done is I've changed this so it's not a single edge I've got two edges here so this looks a little bit like our hole for the telescope this is a gap through which light is passing and essentially a lens or a mirror is this gap is the amount of light that is being collected and as the light passes through here some of it will bend around the edges and if it bends a great deal we get a lot of blurriness we get a lot of interference and we don't get a clear image we've got a moving picture version of this now and in this version we've got a very small gap and we get a large degree of diffraction whatever this image is image was here whatever this image was here that would be coming through whatever this information is it's been massively distorted because we've got a very small gap here if however we've got a larger gap we see a much smaller degree of bending we see a much smaller effect due to diffraction okay now this effect the diffraction effect there's a few points we need to just make here this effect is bigger for larger wavelengths so if the wavelength is large the effect of diffraction is large it is also more pronounced the effect is bigger when the aperture oops that's not used for aperture when the aperture is of a similar size I've got this 
wavy equal sign here which means is of a similar size to the wavelength of the wave so if you've got big waves and you've got a aperture which is about the same size as that wavelength that's going to be a problem now radio waves can be one or two meters long the actual wavelength of a radio wave can re be really quite long so if you want to avoid diffraction you need to make sure your aperture is a hell of a lot bigger than that your aperture needs to be you know four or five meters long which is why we see such huge designs for a radio telescope they need to be big in order to avoid this problem with diffraction so in order to get a clear image you need to have a really large aperture this gives you if you do this if you make sure your aperture is large what you get is high resolving power this is a term I've mentioned before high resolving power that essentially means better detail a less blurry image if you do not have high resolving power you get a blurry image if you have high resolving power you get a clear crisp image alright so I'm just going to have a look at a couple of um, scenarios here where we're going to see some light going through some different barriers so when we've got a small gap we see large diffraction now I've, I look at that what a rush untidy not very neat that's only going to get half marks it deserves in an exam you guys are going to need to draw these in exam so you need to take care of them right what happens if the I've now increased the size of the aperture with an increased width of slit so if you increase the aperture you get less diffraction and if you get less diffraction less diffraction you get a clearer image so that's that's what we're ultimately aiming for here is high resolution and clarity when the gap is very wide compared to the wavelength we're hardly going to notice any effect at all and this wave is going to almost pass through as if there is it's completely unperturbed so you might see a tiny bit of curling at the edges here but essentially we retain this original wave so it's is not noticed so the ideal for astronomers is to build telescopes with large enough apertures or large enough mirrors as it actually turns out being because this is going to be the mirror of your telescope you want a large enough mirror for you not to get any diffraction taking place at all now you might have to draw last one on this sheet here you might have to draw a situation because you do need to know about diffraction generally where this sort of thing might happen and if a wave approaches an edge what happens is it curves around it like this which we mentioned earlier in the video so these waves would then eventually crash into each other here like so and then you end up getting them interfering with one another as they pass onwards what about if we combine a whole load of huge telescopes together so instead of having one big telescope which has got an area of well look that's got an area of one why don't we get five telescopes and give them an area of five what about if we can get 10 telescopes what about if we can get 13 telescopes what about if we can get 25 telescopes and put them all together 
Now this is a technique that is used more and more. It's sort of a, a bit of a cutting edge technique used in astronomy. And this is a picture of the very imaginatively named this is the very large array and the word array sort of means a set or a group this is the very large array telescope which is in New Mexico in the US and what this does is it uses a whole load of telescopes together to try to combine them in such a way that you can pretend you've got a much larger, er larger area. Now to build a mirror that was 100 meters across would be insane. You, you couldn't do it. It's, it's just completely impractical. But if you can pretend you've got all these ones little mirrors and add together all their information and combine it in such a way to make or to trick yourself or to trick the image into thinking it's actually one massive mirror you can do a great deal I'll check this one out this is um, I think this is called the one mile array and yes you guessed it it is a mile across there are hundreds of individual radio telescopes here and each one of these will be taking a photograph of the same thing but from a very very slightly different angle and then what you do is you feed the information from each of these different compute or different uh, telescopes connect them all up by wire and feed it all into one central computer and that central computer takes all these different elements together and adds them up and in the end it synthesizes an image that would have an aperture of approximately one mile in radius so you can combine these images to simulate a very large aperture and why do we want to do this because then if it's a larger aperture it collects more light but most importantly a higher resolution better detail clearer images and we can then study our beautiful universe in finer detail now it's time for our wrap up Let's give it everything we've got. Ready? Begin. Okay, so let's wrap it up. The best mirrors. And you should now know. Oh, look at that. That was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? The best telescopes use mirrors. Mirrors are better than lenses. For all of our hard work studying refractor telescopes, mirrors are better than lenses and a good way for us to remember this is by this loser here this loser who has got refraction with all of his colors bleeding on top of each other because he's unable to distinguish one color from another we've got some serious sagging going on he's not at all smooth check out this bubbly hairy skinny no smoothness there fat in the middle big problem and only the visible part of the spectrum were these risible visibles that he's wearing very unpleasant so lenses are losers and our refractors our reflector mirrors win the day on these you can form some very sophisticated uh, telescopes with some unsophisticated annotation here but the, the point is that you can use these reflectors to in combination with an eyepiece to get fantastic images is bigger better yes you'd better bet it is you get a very large aperture not only do you collect what's that s doing in there that's not getting away with that not only do you collect more light which means you can see dim 
objects from the night sky you get clearer images because you minimize the effect of diffraction why do you minimize the effect of diffraction because diffraction happens when you've got a very large wavelength of light but the problem is most pronounced when the aperture is of a similar sort of size as the wavelength so you want your aperture ideally you want your aperture to be large you want a very large mirror you want a very large lens and that avoids the whole problem of diffraction and that is how we go about designing good telescopes there's one more feature that we're going to have a look at and I'm going to leave that in a separate video but for now that's over and out on the best telescopes